All right, welcome everybody. My name is Mike Sokolow and I'm the director of the McGillicuddy Humanities Center here at the University of Maine. And this year's uh, symposium is called uh, The Story of Climate Change. And tonight's event is Telling the Story of Climate Change, where we are gonna discuss sort of best practices for communicating with the public on this incredibly important and vital subject. So uh, one thing I, I have to announce is that this is going to be recorded and a transcript will be made available at the center's website for future reference if any of you uh, want to access it. And with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Catherine Glover, who will be moderating the panel tonight. Great. Thanks so much. And thanks for asking me to moderate tonight and organizing the space where we can do some storytelling and talk about climate change. Um, so just a few admin things as we get started here tonight. First, um, just ask everyone to make sure that your mic is muted so we can hear the speakers and not pick up background noises during the session tonight. And also, if you have questions or think of them as our panelists speak tonight, please drop those in the chat. We'll definitely have time at the end for questions that you might have for the panelists. And as we um, transition in between folks, if there's an opportune moment to maybe ask a follow-up question, I'll see if we can fit that in too. But I'll be moderating the chat for your thoughts and questions or resources that you want to share, All right? So just a little self-intro on myself, and I'll touch on really briefly some of the same topics that our panelists will talk about tonight. Um, I am Dr. Catherine Glover. I'm a research associate in the Climate Change Institute here at UMaine. And I work on research on past landscapes in Mediterranean climates, and also interested in starting some new projects about how Northeastern forests will change under a warming world. This spring, I'll be teaching in the Women and Gender Studies program with a class called Women and Climate Change. So if you have interested students, they can certainly contact me. You're happy to share information about that. And I'm really excited to moderate tonight and be involved in this topic because as a climate scientist myself, I have often struggled to convey this information to either students or the general public or family members about you know, the need for climate mitigation. And in between my two geoscience degrees, I was a high school earth science teacher as well, and just really learned through a lot of trial and error myself, the importance of storytelling and talking to the public in ways that maybe aren't necessarily catastrophic or so dependent on data and showing like graph after graph of carbon dioxide levels rising. Um, yes, I have done that. So, one of my favorite climate communicators and scientists is Catherine Hayhoe, who has said that the best thing we can do about climate change is to talk to each other and listen about it. So I'm really excited to hear from our panelists tonight about how this has played out in their own sectors and their careers. We've got joining us tonight, Bill Trotter, Dr. Amanda Cross, and Lee Cantor. And we've asked them to speak to first the challenges faced in their work in talking to the public. Um, any anecdotes or stories about successful communication and maybe sometimes that were memorable where there might've been miscommunication. And then any advice that they might have for our audience tonight on best practices for communicating climate change. And with that said, I'll go ahead and introduce each of our panelists. Just one moment here. So our first panelist tonight is Bill Trotter. And he's a veteran Bangor Daily News reporter who writes about how the Atlantic Ocean and the state's how the Atlantic and the state's iconic coastline helped to shape residents and visitors. He is based in Ellsworth, where he writes about fisheries, marine-related topics, and covers eastern coastal Maine communities. We'll then switch to Dr. Amanda Cross, and she is a wildlife biologist with the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife also a member of the Maine Climate Council Science and Technical Subcommittee and Coastal and Marine Working Group. She coordinates Maine's Beginning with Habitat Program and the State Wildlife Action Plan, which empowers communities and landowners with information and techniques to conserve Maine's most at-risk species. Dr. Cross is also a UMaine alumnus and external graduate faculty 
teaching EES 397, 597 professional development for conservation practitioners this spring. And then finally, we'll shift to meet Lee Cantor. And he's a moose biologist for the Maine Department of Inland Fisheries and Wildlife. And in 2019, he had the distinction of being awarded the Distinguished Moose Biologist Award at the 53rd North American Moose Conference held in Carabasset Valley of Maine. So welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us tonight. And with that said, I'll turn it over to our first panelist, Bill, and let him speak to his experiences. Hello, everybody. Can you hear me okay? Great. Uh, thanks very much to the University of Maine uh, to having me involved in this topic. It's something that uh, I think about frequently uh, in my job as a reporter with the Bangor Daily News. Um, uh, it's a little bit different for me than other panelists because I actually do have a direct line to the public uh, through my work. Um, uh, obviously, I, I, I write for our audience. We used to be called readers is what you used to call people who read the Bangor Daily News. Now the term is audience. So uh, in choosing to, what stories to present to our audience, I often think about what's going to be the most effective way to do that and what uh, topics uh, they might be interested in. Um, I do have the luxury of being able to kind of pick and choose uh, what I might write about. Um, obviously, a scientist who's dedicated to one particular subject line doesn't have that kind of flexibility. Um, so it's, it's a little bit more challenging for, for somebody who can't jump around from one subtopic to another like I can. Um, so uh, the challenges, that, again, that I face are trying to figure out what people will be interested in. Uh, it's um, often it involves uh, people in their daily lives and what they might notice. Um, for example, yesterday, uh, I left my house here in Ellsworth and went down to Ellsworth Harbor Park around noon because uh, there was a king high tide and I wanted to see how, how high the tide was going to be. Um, I actually got there a little bit late. Uh, by the time I got there, I could see the, the line of leaves at the top of the boat ramp and the water had already receded from there. Um, and it wasn't that unusual. Uh, there wasn't like water covering the roadway or anything. I thought it might be a story there, but there really wasn't. But the reason I was interested is because that's the a type of example of climate change directly interjecting with uh, a person's daily life. If it comes up and covers the road, they're going to notice. Uh, and that is something that is more likely going to be something that would interest our readers, our audience. Uh, if they saw something unusual, that's an opportunity for us to explain. This is what caused uh, what you saw yesterday that seemed unusual. Um, in Portland, they often have king tides that come up over the, the docks uh, along Commercial Street there, off Commercial Street. And it all, always causes a story, even though at this point, people ought to know it, that high tides just happen sometimes. But still, it draws attention and we want to write about it each and every time um, because it's, it's an issue that's not going away. Uh, even if it's something that people may have seen before at this point. So um, uh, I know we, one of the things we're asked to do is share anecdotes about successes. Um, uh, I like to think I've been fairly successful in, in the stories that I write. I don't know that I have any sort of miscommunication adventures. Um, I, I don't just write about climate change and I can think of some examples of stories I've written that ended up being misadventures. But uh, they weren't about climate change, so I won't get into them uh, tonight for the sake of uh, this uh, video event. Um, and in terms of picking and choosing, uh, a good example is, um, again, something that people will notice in their daily lives. Uh, climate change often affects um, uh, the natural world, but in ways that people can understand. And I write a lot about fishers. And so um, when climate change affects lobster catches, that's an opportunity for me to write about climate change. Uh, people are more likely to, to follow and be interested in iconic main species like moose, uh, for example, uh, or lobster. And so when climate change has a direct impact on these species that people are already paying attention to anyway, that's an opportunity to write about it and explain 
if this is why lobster catches have ballooned so much in the past years, or why they're higher now in Eastern Maine than they used to be, and they're lower than they used to be in Western Maine, because the water's uh, warmer down in Western Maine than it used to be, um, and they're migrating slowly eastward along the coast. So, um, uh, finding ways that, that will immediately appeal to people uh, and that in ways that they can understand fairly easily because they're already familiar with, um, you know, water over the roadway or species like lobster or species like moose um, is, is a good way for us to be able to write about climate change in, in an immediate way that people can, can connect with. So uh, I, I don't want to ramble on too long. I'll leave it there for now. All right. Well, thanks so much for that, Bill. Um, and again, as folks have questions or comments, please use the chat and we can use these transitions to ask follow-up questions to our panelists tonight. Um, Dr. Cross, we'll go ahead and shift to you and let you speak to some of your experiences with storytelling climate change. Yeah, thank you so much, Katie. And, and thanks to the University of Maine for this opportunity. It's, it's incredibly important. Um, and I did, I did quite a bit of thinking in preparation for this and, and reflecting on sort of my role as a traditionally trained scientist, very much in love with statistics and graphs and figures and totally nerding out on everything. And then my role now as a communicator with a variety of audiences, whether it be school children talking about vernal pools or communities thinking about comprehensive planning and how they're going to address climate change in those plans. And so, um, you know, some, some challenges that, that I've encountered is kind of getting away from that natural mindset that I have of those facts and figures. Those are important. I think as scientists, you know, hanging our hats on facts and figures is a part of our DNA. And it's a part of what gives us credibility and authority to talk, to speak on these subjects. But oftentimes, and I know many of us here on this call when we're at a conference or we're at a class and we're on slide 55 and it's another graph, it is like glaze over time. And so I think it's really important to remember that, you know, sometimes as scientists, we have to get a little bit out of our comfort zone, maybe step away from that Linus blanket comfort of graphs and figures and really be able to talk and talk in real terms and get away from some of the lexicons that we use often. And I'll give it an example of where I've messed up in the past in that, in that exact arena. Um, you know, I think uh, often too with climate change, it's, uh, it's a global issue. And I think oftentimes when we speak about it, we think we, we're speaking in terms of massive temperature changes, massive precipitation changes. And it's hard to conceptualize what that looks, in li looks like in your backyard. And it often leaves people feeling powerless. If you're thinking about sea level rise, as a landowner, what the heck can you do as one little landowner to address that? And so I think that can be a challenge. And so being able to speak to what people can do and what parts of this each of us can tackle in our own way is really important. Um, part of my role at Inland Fisheries and Wildlife is to take kind of this large scale statewide information and downscale it to the levels that people are using it, whether it be communities or landowners or land trusts or school groups. And so, so part of my training and part of my professional development is, is learning how to do that, to, to get out of that mindset that I'm always in of the facts and figures and get down to that connection point that works for people and go to them rather than expecting them to sort of come to you and be able to understand the lexicon that you're using, being able to figure out what lexicon or what messages are important to them and connect with them where they're at. Um, you know, a couple, a couple of stories, we were asked to share some stories that we've encountered. And I've had a few, at, at, you know, both personally and professionally. And, and I was thinking about some work that I did a couple years back as part of the um, main interagency climate adaptation group. And in this group, there are representatives from agencies across the state, from you know, natural resource agencies like mine to um, 
Department of Health and Human Services to Department of Transportation, all across the board. And we, we came together to talk about the different ways our agencies are addressing climate change. And I realized that I was sort of one voice for the agency and that there are many other voices. And if, if you're not familiar with our agency, we, we certainly do quite a bit of species management, habitat management, research, things like that. But another huge portion of our agency is the Maine Warden Service. And many folks are familiar with them from Northwoods Law, for example, um, and their work in finding lost people and arresting poachers and that kind of stuff. And that's you know almost half of our agency. And so I went to a colleague there and said, well, what do you see for climate change? What, what can I bring to this group from the warden services perspective? And he thought about it and he did some research, talked to some folks within the main warden service. And he came back with, to me with these graphs, but very good graphs of you know, observations they've had. Um, things like increased nuisance calls on the shoulder season. So where they would have gotten nuisance calls for animals where people are running into nuisance animals, raccoons in their backyard or skunks under the porches, things like that, where we sort of were having this general trend all of a sudden within the past few years, having more and more calls for a longer period of time. And so to me, that was a that was a wake up call, not only to think about how we're communicating outside with our audiences, but also internally, even in a small agency like ours at IFNW, how do we talk to warden service who is dealing with different concepts, different implications of climate change than I might be as a wildlife biologist. And Lee will have, um, I'm sure, excellent anecdotes to talk about in his world in terms of moose management. I think that. Um, you know, one thing that's that's important that I mentioned earlier is is communicating sort of and empowering people to take action at the level that they can. Oftentimes when I'm working with communities and talking about um, these large scale challenges like climate change, I always get the question, well, what can we do in, in this town of X? What is it that we can possibly do here? We don't have anything special. We don't necessarily have a mapped species, certain species or certain habitat, what is it that we can do? And the answer is habitat connectivity, habitat conservation, thinking about your backyard, creating habitat for pollinators. It doesn't matter what you have, there's something you can do. So I think that message is, is very important and it's, it's genuine. There is something that each and every one of us can do at multiple levels. Um, and I would say, you know, for me, you need to speak off authentically when you're talking about this or, or any issue. Um, and I'll, you know, one example is um, we talk a lot about marsh migration and with sea level rise where our existing marshes are, they'll continue to move inland. And that might be okay if you have undeveloped areas right adjacent to those marshes, but what happens if you have built up areas, if you have a building or a parking lot right near where that marsh would be going? And so I, I, you know, with colleagues talked about it, seen maps, looked at the data, and it didn't hit home until I walked the trail that's right behind my house here. And I looked at the salt marsh that I live right near. And I noticed that this ring of pines that surrounds the marsh is dying and the ring of huckleberry around the marsh is dying. And I noticed that within the last year, they're dying more. And that's because salt water is, is intruding these normally non-salty habitats. And to me, seeing that really solidified the concepts that I've been hearing about and talking about and thinking about, seeing it in person with my own eyes in my literally my own backyard is what resonated. So I think finding that personal connection is always, always so important. And you know, just just sort of an example of where I've <laughs> I've messed up, and I've messed up probably in many ways that I don't even know yet. Um, but certainly, lexicon is important, and being careful about the words you use and making sure you're using them in the context that's appropriate for your audience. So the example I always think about is the term landscape, and I am an overuser of that word left and right. We have to connect the landscape. We need unfragmented landscapes. We need intact landscapes. And I was talking to a group 
And someone asked, well, we've got a couple landscaping companies in town. Do you mean like planting bushes? And I was like, you know what? You're right. If you're not sort of in this realm, day in and day out, the term landscape, you're gonna think maybe of somebody mowing your grass and not thinking of, of the way we're using it as kind of landscape ecologists. So just being aware of the terms you use, how people relate to them or, or don't relate to them, um, I think is really important. And so just some, some final you know, take homes or best practices, if you will, is really you know, finding that connection point, whatever audience it is that you're talking with, Figure out what it is that they care about and speak to them, you know, with authenticity about why what they care about is important to the bigger issues of climate change. Um, present them with opportunities for action. Like I said, each of us, regardless of the scale you're working at, can do something. And then finally, I think it's important to leave with a message of hope. Because if you leave a communication event and you feel like you just want to curl up in a ball or curl up under a rock, um, it's hard to take action in that state. And so, you know, not to give false hope, but to give people an opportunity to give them a place to take action, I think is incredibly important. And as scientists and managers and communicators, um, that's, that's incredibly important. And it's a way to empower people and allow them to make changes in their own lives. So with that, I will turn it over to a much more engaging storyteller on a much more engaging suite of species, <laughs> Lee Cantar. Hey, well, thanks to the university for this invitation and uh, Amanda, thanks for uh, saying that very generous stuff. But I, I would actually turn this back to you and say, I just learned a lot about how I should be communicating uh, because when I look at what you guys have asked here about challenges and everything when it comes to moose and the story about winter tick and, and what's, what's playing out right now, there, there is yet to be any success with communication. I mean, let's, let, let's be forthright here where we're at, which is, um, you know, we have many challenges when it comes to talking about wildlife um, and, and engaging the broader public and not just traditional users or, or whatever you want to call folks, but um, everybody who has a stake, which is which is everybody, whether somebody is lives in a very urban area or not. And of course, moose in the state of Maine is uh, is, is phenomenal. It's a, it's a tremendous resource here, but what's happening now and trying to explain this is a massive challenge. And so all these lists and anecdote, what works, all this, I can wrap this all into one thing of, it's none of it's really going well right now because the first part of this is, um, you know, in Maine, the story of moose is a reemergent story that's happened in a very short time frame, And this is really interesting when it comes to what's happening with climate change. Um, so moose, of course, were almost in the 1930s gone out of the state of Maine. That was a, a time when uh, farmland, lots of farmland was being abandoned. We had lots of deer coming in, very few moose. So back in the 70s with this big spruce budworm epidemic and uh, in the commercial forest lands in Northern and Central Maine, and it created a, a great opportunity for uh, young successional forests that moose love and bam, moose just took off and moose took off and started to repopulate the area so great in Maine that of course they went into New Hampshire and into Vermont and all the way down into Connecticut. So we have moose populations in Connecticut and Massachusetts. We're all the same moose. Uh, so moose have done very, very well. And people love seeing moose. And um, boy, in the 1980s into the 90s, people saw moose everywhere. There are big clear cuts. What a fantastic thing. But um, what was creeping in the background here was this little tiny terror called the winter tick, which is another complication to our communications piece because people, and this is kind of what Amanda was saying when you talked about landscape. So when somebody says winter tick, um, they think it's the same thing as a deer tick or the same thing as a dog tick. And not a lot of people know that there's a ton of different tick species, but the winter tick is its own species. In fact, the crazy thing about the winter tick is that these other species of ticks that we have to be very concerned about with human health, like the deer tick, which spreads Lyme disease and anaplasmosis, and everybody needs to be aware of. 
um, spends its three life stages on three different organisms. So when the deer tick is a larvae, and then it becomes a nymph, then it becomes an adult, it drops off the host and has to attach to something else and takes blood from that. Well, with the winter tick, um, it spends those three life stages on one organism, larval, nymph, adult, all on one same animal, taking blood meals from that same animal. And that's what gets kind of crazy uh, about this story is that the winter tick only lives for one year. The other tick species live for three years. And it's spending that one year, which is really condensed from fall into spring on the back of an animal. And it happens to be that the moose, who I love dearly, is very naive when it comes to getting ticks on it in the fall. And so the ticks climb up on the moose. The moose has no idea the ticks are on it. Um, other animals get ticks on them, the, the winter tick the, or the so-called moose tick. Um, but they're able to groom them off, lick them off, bite them off, scratch them off. You know, deer will do that when they get winter ticks on them, snowshoe hares. But moose don't realize the ticks are on them until uh, midwinter when uh, they've already changed into nymphs and they're already taking their second blood meal. The other crazy thing is that uh, instead of getting one, two or three or four ticks on you, like if I'm walking my dogs, my dog gets a deer tick on it. When a moose walks by a bush, it gets uh, tens of thousands of ticks on it. And so ultimately you'll have a tick come, I'm sorry, a moose come spring that uh, may have 60 to 90,000 ticks on it um, that have molted into adults um, in March and are taking blood meals. And each winter tick, female winter tick can take about a mill of blood um, so you're starting to see that this is, this is taking a lot from a moose. So, okay, back up to the communication piece. So what I've been told is we've done a great job. The department's done a great job communicating about winter ticks. Everybody knows about winter ticks, but the anecdote and the other part of this equation is that, uh, people don't know the difference in these ticks. And this is, this is very important because again, I just told you that a deer tick we all need to know about because they can give us a human disease. Winter ticks don't do this, they impact the moose. So we need to make sure we understand those two different beings. Um, so that's been a real, real challenge. And then the other thing is people will always talk to me and they go, uh, there's no more moose left and all, the, all the, the ticks are killing all the moose. And it's like, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, so yeah, there's a lot of ticks, um, but they're impacting the young moose, the calves getting through their first winter. And um, they're doing that at a high rate on our GPS collared moose. We put collars on these moose. And we think that speaks to a larger area, but that's part of the piece. And then let's talk about the climate piece and jump back into that, which is, well, what does that have to do with anything? So I told you that moose were on the rise uh, into the 90s, probably at their high point by the turn of the century. This, this century, 2000, right? Um, so we had a lot of moose, winter ticks were coming right behind it because moose don't understand that the ticks are on them. Well, why are there more ticks today? Okay, the winter tick um, has always been here. We can date it back to the 20s in Maine. Uh, winter tick are ubiquitous from Northern United States all the way down into Texas. Um, but what happens is in the state of Maine, when you have a normal summer, fall, winter, spring, uh, fall weather comes in, early snow, and it kills the ticks. And only so many ticks can get on a moose. But in the last 20 years, we've seen a shift. And every day when, when fall is warmer, those ticks are still out there until we get an event like a, like a freezing rain event or a snowstorm that comes in and, and kills the rest of those ticks clinging to bushes, just hoping to get on a moose. So every day that fall gets extended. And I know the climate folks at uh, the university have said that there's been a two week shift, which, and this is great because this is what Amanda was saying, which is your, your global perspective versus the perspective of living in Maine. How is it affecting Maine? Well, two weeks doesn't sound like a lot. Some people are going, yay, that's great. Maine winters suck. Let's have more summer. This is great. But two weeks for a moose means Every day of those two weeks, more ticks are getting on a moose to the point where instead of having a load of 10,000 winter ticks on a moose, let's say, because they have that extended 
time period where ticks are able to get on before a snowstorm, now they get 90,000 ticks. And then on the other end of things in the springtime, springtime comes earlier and we're waiting for green up to come so moose can get protein. And two weeks can make a big difference, whether it's a really nasty two weeks of continued winter or not, uh, to whether that calf with a lot of ticks on it can survive uh, to make it to its first birthday. So it's a complicated story. Um, you know, I don't want to spend too much time because I can tell lots of stories and lots of anecdotes, but um, I'll just finish by saying that the issue with moose tick is a is, is a is a three things coming together. It's we've had a lot of moose in the state of Maine uh, for various reasons. The winter tick has blossomed and lagged behind it, but it continues to increase because of climate moderating, even with a shift of two weeks in the state of Maine. So the more that shifts, the worse things get. And as you can tell, um, what was it, two weeks ago, a couple weeks ago in November here, we had uh, a week that was like almost in the 70s. Um, when, when weather's like that, it's, yeah, it's, it's nice to sit out on your back de deck, but um, it's not fun, to, fun from a moose perspective. Thank you, Lee. And I want to ask, it sounds like in your conversations with the public, you actually talk people through some of the complexity of these natural systems and how climate plays a role in that. Have you had much success with that? Do people come away from these conversations feeling they've learned something or have insight or what's the reaction it's, that you get? It's, um, it's confounding within the scientific community and moose. Mm -hmm. um, there's, some, there's some other things going on with, uh, with heat stressed discussions that that are really applicable and been a little bit misconstrued, I think. But um, and it's tough because, you know, the effect of climate and winter ticks is kind of an indirect thing. And uh, so it's a complicated story to tell. And and for me, it's it's like a, honestly, it's a one person at a time deal. Um, I mean, our department's been very fortunate because we've gained more personnel when it comes to I and E information and education. Um, but as Amanda can probably attest to as well, is that uh, the Achilles heel of our department has always been communication. And of course, we're usually, you know, typecast as, you know, fish and wildlife. And so somebody who thinks, hey, I don't, I don't hunt, I don't fish. Why, why do I care about fish and wildlife department? But, uh, you know, I keep talking about Amanda, but I mean, she can tell you her program beginning with Habitat, um, all the work that she and... Uh, people she works with have, do is conservation for all wildlife uh, in the state of Maine that every person who lives in the state of Maine should be uh, concerned with and that our department supports. But it's one of those things from a communication thing that people, people uh, you know, just think of fish and wildlife as kind of old school or they think of the game wardens. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so we, we have those issues as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I'll take that opportunity to transition back to Amanda and ask you a question. Um, Lee, in hearing you speak, I noticed you actually did like use some facts and figures. I think what was really impactful to me was you talking about that young moose sweeping by the bush that had 90,000 ticks. And I don't know if I saw myself and like others react on the call to that, but that seems a place where like using that fact, that number was really compelling. And I wanted to ask Amanda, since you talked about, you know, the switch between scientific spaces where it's graph after graph, I've had that experience as well of being at the conference in a dark room and you get to that 30th graph in the presentation. Do you find in your work, there is some space for facts and figures or audiences that might be a little bit receptive to maybe again, like one piece of information at a time, but. Yeah, absolutely. And and oftentimes I parasitize a lot of Lee's stuff because oftentimes people are really interested in moose. Everyone cares about moose. And and sometimes I'll I'll use his information as an example. But but I think when it comes to facts and figures, at, at least in the program that I administer, oftentimes those facts and figures are sort of a place-based perspective. So people really want to know what's in their town, what's in their backyard, which endangered species are here, which at-risk species are here, and then where are the places on the landscape where we can connect these species 
habitats to be able to allow them to persist into the future. And so, um, you know, we, we certainly provide facts um, at a variety of scales, you know, things like um, putting the importance of the Northern forest into a global, con global context that, that here in this place in Maine, in our backyards, we're in the largest temperate forest in the world. That's huge, that's important, that's, that's right here. And so taking a big fact like that, but then also boiling it down to, um, you know, I'm thinking of a presentation I did to a coastal community about a year ago, pre-COVID, and it really got down to, here are the places in your town where we find climate vulnerable species. This is where there are salt marsh sparrows. This is where there are salt marsh tiger beetles. These are the places that are important to conserve. And I think having those place-based pictures, maps, things like that are so powerful for folks. Um, and then obviously coupling it with horror stories like, like Lee talks about with, with moose and, and ticks. I always, I, whenever I do a presentation, I always start by saying, this presentation will have no figures and no graphs and no tables. But I, I've been there and I use, I use that data all the time, but I find now, man, it gets rough, mostly because I don't understand any of that anyways, but uh, no. Um. I just want to uh, jump in here and, and mention something that hasn't really uh, come up yet um, in a way of trying to relate how climate change uh, affects us and uh, it affects our daily lives. And I don't mean to be totally crass about this, but money is part of it. And uh, everybody uh, has some sort of understanding about, you know, the cost, monetary cost of climate change and what the impact might be. Certainly, you know, if, if it affects moose, moose is a big draw to the state of Maine. Uh, there are a lot of people who live here in Maine who want to see moose or who hunt moose, who want to just get photos of moose, but it draws people from out of state too. And if something would to happen, if the moose population were to really drop, that sense of uh, tourism would be affected. Um, it affects people who live on the, sh the coastline. You know, when you have a big storm that comes in and uh, the water levels rise and you have a king tide and you have winds pushing that ashore, it affects all those homes along the coast. And there's a danger there, but there's also uh, like flood insurance. That's something that people can relate to because all of a sudden I have to pay flood insurance for my house and it's going to cost me how much, you know, that's a real kind of gut uh, impact that climate change has on people. Um, something that I'm familiar with in my work is the impact on fisheries. And uh, Lee had mentioned some uh, unseasonable weather not too long ago when it was like 70 degrees or so. That instantly reminded me of the spring of 2012 uh, when it was really warm, bizarrely warm uh, on the main coast. And I remember going down to Sand Beach in Acadia National Park. It was a 75 degree day in early March and people were walking around out there like taking their shoes off, rolling their pant legs up. And it was just, it was weird. There were people, there were kids jumping off the pier into the harbor in downtown Bar Harbor on like mid-March when often there's like eight inches of snow on the ground. It was just very strange. Um, but that was part of a pattern that spring of really warm weather that led to an insane number of landings in the elver fishery. Normally, the elver season starts out in mid-March, very slow because the water's still cold, there's snow on the ground, there's lots of runoff going downstream in the rivers into the coves and tidal rivers. And that low temperature keeps the elver landings, elver, uh, elvers, the numbers low in the rivers. It was warm from the get-go that year, and guys were catching elvers by the fistful on the first day of the fishing season. And the price was up through the roof, and uh, people caught a ton of elvers, people made a ton of money, and you think, well, that's great. Who doesn't like nice weather? <laughs> Who doesn't like making a lot of money? You know, the, again, to Lee's point, some people won't really have a problem with winters in Maine not being that, uh, that harsh. But the flip side of that was, the impact that it had on um, marine patrol, elver fishing laws, it brought a lot of unexpected and really undesired 
impact, i.e. poaching. Uh, and the state had to get its hands around that. It had to go to the legislature and really ramp up some of their uh, uh, the laws regulating the industry. Um, so part of it, of course, is is predictability. When it comes to climate change, a lot of it's unpredictable, and that can play havoc for a lot of people. And you might be having a nice sunny day out there in March, but there's a flip side to it. And if you can't really plan ahead that well because you don't know how the climate's going to change over the next few years, it's it really can make things tough for people. And it was pretty sticky there for, for a while for the state trying to get their hands around the new realities in the health industry. That's for sure. Yeah, thanks for touching on economy because we have a really great question in the chat um, from Nate Poole that I'd like to pose to Leah or Amanda. Um, and he asks, when you're communicating climate change to the public, how do you negotiate situations where communities believe that more environmental policy might threaten economies or values? That's all you, Amanda. <laughs> um, well, I'll do my best here. Yeah, so I mean, within, within my small realm of the department, you know, what we're communi communicating are, are really, you know, the toolbox of strategies and information that a community itself can use to address different conservation issues, whether it be habitat fragmentation or, or climate change. And so at least in my role, that the stance that I take in communicating is not to, to direct policy or say that a community should enact a certain regulation. It's basically to say, this, this is the information, these are the strategies you can use. And as a town or a, a land trust or a landowner, it is up to you to, to decide what vision or strategy you want to take. You know, I do think that, um, that that is going to be a really interesting um, discussion as we look at the Maine Climate Council's action plan. Um, there's a draft of it available now. It will be finalized December 1st, but where there are potentially some new policies that will come out of that to see um, you know, how people react. I think that that there's a lot of um, benefits, you know, to to thinking and incorporating climate change into policies and planning that ultimately reduce costs. I mean, so for example, um, planning your infrastructure projects such that they accommodate, you know, hundred-year floods in the long run will be cheaper. So I think, um, not to sidestep the question, but I think it it depends on the community. It depends on sort of the questions or the the regulations that they might be asking about. Thank you. And we've got a question from our organizer, Michael, um, who asks, in Australia, the wildfires last year changed the political discussion around climate change. There are no more deniers. Is Maine threatened by anything like that? Do you think there's anything that would shift people's political stances if they were to experience it firsthand? That's open to any panelist. No one specific the thing, mentioned the thing, there. First thing that comes to my mind is drought. Um, that's a statewide issue. Um, sea level rise is certainly is a big one, but it's not going to be a really big problem for uh, you know a lot of a lot of the state that doesn't border the sea. Um, but drought absolutely is something that affects people statewide. Or if uh, uh, something like ticks. Um, the prevalence of ticks out there, uh, be it for moose or for people, um, and, uh, not to lump them all together because I know it's important to differentiate between the types of ticks, thanks to Lee, but um, <laughs> things like that certainly would be a statewide issues. Drought was the first thing that came to my mind because that, that'll affect everybody. And thank goodness it hasn't gotten really bad here in Maine so far, but as unpredictable as climate change can be sometimes, uh, who knows? It could be a big problem without much warning. Yeah, I'll just, uh, you know, I don't want to keep throwing, throwing, throwing stuff to Amanda or whatever, but um, you know, it's tough. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm moose, moose central, moose focus. That's, that's, that's all I deal with. And so, um, you know, it's a little bit 
different different for me. And you know, as far as wildlife in the state of Maine, and of course Amanda can jump in. You know, we're already seeing a shift in species, right? So we have we have some species that were formerly south of here, like possums. I think somebody was talking about uh, I don't know, the northern cardinal the other day at a meeting we had. There's species that are making their way into southern Maine. And some people may say, that's great, man. I love to, I love to see something like that. And then there's species like the moose um, and, and the candle lynx that, that we always talk about in our talks where we say, well, we're at the southern periphery of their range, which always drives me crazy because it's like, well, they live here. So yeah, it's it's the southern range, but it's, you know, it's how big, how big is the area we're talking about? I mean, they're already down in, they, they, they go down to Connecticut. Um, but, but things may shrink and moose, moose range may shrink. The problem with climate change and one of our biggest uh, dilemmas here is that we know climate is changing, but for something like the moose and winter tick and whether there's gonna be more snow or less snow, we, we don't have that answer. So, so what are moose gonna look like in 20, 50, 100 years? I don't know, because it's really, really complicated. For other species, especially ones that are probably much more habitat uh, driven, there's probably a much more clear cut answer as to where we'll be. Um, but, but the moose situation in, in this scenario is a little bit more sticky and therefore difficult to communicate. Yeah, I think, um, I, you know, both the, to follow up on what Bill and Lee said, I mean, we, I think drought is absolutely one of those kind of universally um, important things for our state. You know, thinking about this from sort of an ecologist perspective and thinking about our state as one that has, you know, an ecological diversity that is rivals that of all of Europe. It's all of Europe smushed into our one state. That's how diverse we are ecologically. And so I think some of the changes that we'll see on the landscape are going to vary. Like Bill mentioned, sea level rise really is pretty much applicable to the coast and as it makes its way slightly inland. Um, but, but I think like Bill had mentioned, you know, the expansion of white-tailed deer and the associated tick-borne illnesses that accompany that. I mean, I think, you know, where you, talk to people and um, say, you know, I never saw a deer tick in Aroostook County and, and here I have Lyme's disease now. And so I think that's one of those ones where the connection with climate is not necessarily obvious, but it's one that is sort of applies to everyone who spends any time outside. Um, I think another one that has statewide implications, but maybe in different ways, is the impact of invasive forest pests, where we're a state that's 89% forested. And, you know, on the coast here, we're dealing with things like winter moths in different areas, spruce budworm and, and, and other sorts of uh, um, insects that are either recur have been here and are recurring or are coming in new, um, I think universally that's, that's something that people will see more and more across different, different forest types. I think, you know, um, infrastructure impacts to infrastructure. Um, certainly that's felt like Bill was saying when, you know, downtown Portland floods with every king tide. But certainly if you think about Hurricane Irene a few years back and the flooding that did in the Carabasset Valley. So I think that's another area that people can instantly relate to. And, you know, we have we have infrastructure all over the state. And so thinking about how those really heavy January rains on top of you know, frozen soil, how that impacts flooding um, across the state. I think that's another kind of universal thing. I don't, I don't, I'm not sure if any of those rise to the same level of the you know, Australia example, Mike, that you had there in the chat box, but I think you know, there's certainly many factors at play that have statewide importance that I think collectively increase people's awareness. One more I want to add, uh, Maine hasn't really been uh, hit by a, a really bad tropical storm, um, uh, but certainly that has potential uh, to affect absolutely the entire state if, uh, if the storm is strong enough and it comes into the Gulf of Maine at the right angle at the right time of year, that would have regional uh, impact all at once and would really uh, open a lot of eyes if that ever were to happen. Knock on wood, I hope it doesn't. But. 
hard to predict. Great, thank you all. We are rounding out the end of the hour for tonight's event. And there's still time if participants want to squeeze in a question to the chat box, I'll ask our panelists. But in the meantime, I think I'll ask each of you, you know, Amanda had mentioned finding connection points and leaving people, um, so or leaving audiences with something that's forward thinking. So perhaps each of our panelists could say something briefly to that effect. You know, we've talked about a lot of the different dire effects that climate can change can have. What's a piece that we can take with us tonight moving forward um, that could inspire us to action or leave us with a little bit of hope? Uh, well, I'll go first. And that's actually something that uh, we've been talking about in the Bangor Daily News lately is uh, how to uh, uh, pursue journalism that's called uh, solutions journalism. Because for a long time, journalism uh, was in the, had a, a habit of just writing about, oh, this is the way things are. Uh, just in case you're curious, here's your information for you. Uh, good luck with that. You know, we'll see you later. And there wasn't a whole lot of, here's some ideas to pursue uh, that might address this thing that we're writing about. Um, and that's something we've been talking about more at the Bangor Daily News is, is trying to uh, write more stories about A, a problem, but B, uh, an approach that a group, an organization, a town, whatever it might be, has taken to address that problem and how effective that solution has been. Um, there's a lot of planning uh, going on um, now with some coastal towns, it, uh, assessing their infrastructure and trying to uh, plan ahead for what is going to get impacted by sea level rise. Um, certainly there's a low line road uh, between uh, Deer Isle, uh, that connects Deer Isle and Stonington um, to Little Deer Isle. And there's a large bridge that goes over Agamogon Reach. But that road is something that it faces um, some pretty immediate challenges if the sea level rise starts to pick up. And so there needs to be some planning done. Um, and so it's not just writing about things that are happening. Um, from my point of view, but it's also writing about the most urgent needs and, um, and being fairly consistent about it because um, it's, it's tough to address a problem if you just write about it once and leave it and then you go off and you come back a year later. Um, you know, there has to be a fairly consistent eyeballs on the situation and storytelling about it to keep it in people's minds. Um, even if you're not gonna go so far as trying to come up with a, a, a solution right off the bat, what might be done, you want people thinking about it on a fairly regular basis. Um, so that's something that I've been trying to do is not just write about what one town is doing to address climate change, but then to follow up again six months later and talk to them again and say, hey, is there an update that I can write about your situation here? So people can know what kind of progress they're making or, or how more severe the problem's getting. Staying, being consistent, I think, is a, is a big part of that. That's great to hear. I was just reading about a Climate to Thrive, which is MDI's nonprofit that has a model for more sustainable communities. And it sounds like now resources that um, other communities or towns could pick up to start doing their own planning around yeah, sustainability. Yeah, they're being very, very proactive. That's a good, yeah. a good model that they have. That's done. great. Yeah. Um, Amanda, how about you? Sure. Yeah, I, I think it it really gets down to awareness of where you're at, you know, what's and not to be trite, but what what's in your backyard? What's in your community? What are the vulnerable species? What are the vulnerable habitats? And how do you in your own realm as a landowner or, you know, member of an organization or, or whatever, how do you address those things and plan for their it, you know, persistence into the future. Um, I think being aware of what you have locally and then figuring out, you know, how, how does your town account for these things? So for example, does your town talk about climate change and its municipal comprehensive plan? Do you, does, does your town think about things like habitat connectivity when they're looking at the growth areas in town versus the rural areas in town? Things like that. So I think it, it starts with an awareness of place 
and then understanding what are those entry points for where you can make change. And for some people, it may simply be dedicating part of their lawn to a pollinator garden. That in and of itself, if we all did that, that would be a huge patchwork of pollinator areas to move across the landscape. So I think it's it's that building awareness first and then figuring out how you could take action at a scale that's appropriate to, to you and your situation. I love this idea of a pollinator garden. It sounds almost like the victory gardens that folks were encouraged to have in World War II. Um, Lee, any final comments? Well, I guess I'd make the point similar to what I said before about our Fish and Wildlife Department that uh, I think it would be news to a lot of people that the department's been trying to expand just about everything we do. Um, that includes being much more inclusive. That talks about uh, diversity among people, um, about getting people outdoors, not just fishing and hunting, but getting outdoors to experience Maine uh, in all its glory. And so I think, I think if people really looked into the Department of Fish and Wildlife, uh, this is sounding like a kind of a infomercial plug, but it really is true is that we're trying to expand our audience, um, you know, all for the good purpose of people taking care of our planet and taking care of our place uh, right here in Maine. And, uh, and hopefully that message that's been emerging with our department in the last couple of years will continue to emerge and we'll get new people coming into the fold who understand, uh, you know, the role our department plays in conservation for, for all the critters in uh, this great state. Thank you, Lee. And again, thanks to our panelists for joining us tonight and everybody who turned, tuned in tonight to listen to this conversation and your questions. Um, Michael, I don't know if you have any final comments or want to wrap up. I just want to thank our panelists again. Great, great, fascinating stuff. And, uh, and uh, so thank you very much, everybody. And uh, have a great Stay safe. <laughs> Stay safe mm -hmm. and have a great Thanksgiving. Thanks very much. Thank you. All right. Thanks again. Great to hear from you all.